we should now be on our way. Here we are. Great. So we're now live in our stream, and I'd like to turn over to Sina to begin the event. Thank you very much, David. And uh, good morning, good evening, good afternoon to everyone. And a warm welcome to our distinguished panelists and speakers and to everyone taking the time to participate in this event. Just a few practical remarks to start us off. Uh, translation into Spanish, English and Russian is available. You just need to click on the globe and select which language you prefer. Please also introduce yourself in the chat and post any questions you may have to the panel in the Q&A box, as we will have some time for discussions later on in the session. My name is Sina Lett. I'm a senior advisor at the International Work Group for Indigenous Affairs, or IFGIA, and I will be moderating this event today. The event is co-organized with Indigenous Peoples' Rights International, Observatorio Ciudadano, and INFOE. If GIA has been involved in the issue of the UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights since the adoption of the principles. If GIA has supported the effective participation of indigenous peoples in the meetings of the Working Group on Business and Human Rights, as well as the UN Forum on Business and Human Rights. If GIA has also supported local indigenous organizations in understanding and using the principles to ensure their rights at the local level. In 2014, IFGIA published a report entitled Business and Human Rights, Interpreting the UN Guiding Principles for Indigenous Peoples, with the aim to raise awareness and understanding among Indigenous peoples themselves on the guiding principles and the relevance to them. I'm therefore very pleased that today we will officially be launching the publication called The UN Guiding Principles on Business and Human Rights and Indigenous Peoples, Progress Achieved, the Implementation Gap, and the Challenges for the Next Decade, written by the same two committed authors who wrote the first report. They've tirelessly been working in this field, and we will be speaking with them later in today's event, Johannes Rohr and Jose Alvin. But before we turn to that conversation, I'm very honored to present Mr. Dante Pesce for the opening remarks. Mr. Dante Pesce is the chair of the Working Group on the Issue of Human Rights, and transnational corporations and other business enterprises. He's also the founder and executive director of the Vincula Center for Social Responsibility and Sustainable Development at the Catholic University in Chile. And this organization is working in 14 Latin American countries in outreach capacity building and advisory services related to sustainability and responsible business practices. Mr. Pesce is also a special advisor on public policy to the UN Global Compact and a member of the Stakeholder Council to the Global Reporting Initiative. Welcome, Mr. Pesce. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, greetings from uh, Geneva, where we are after 15 months in session of the working group. Uh, so it's the first week that we actually see our faces in, in so many so long months. So there's a little bit of a feeling of normality somehow, uh, despite having empty rooms, but, uh, but at least the, the meetings are, are happening. Um, <clears throat> I was chair of the working group until yesterday. As you probably know, we rotate uh, the five members of the working group. So starting today is actually Surya, but uh, since he's not here in Geneva, I, I, let's say, roll over and remain acting chair <laughs> for today and tomorrow. But uh, so minor, minor detail. Uh, let me get into uh, the specific, um, let's say, topic of our conversation. Um, we planned uh, with two and a half years of advance, the, uh, the evaluation of the first 10 years of the implementation of the guiding principles on business and human rights. We, we look after uh, political support, let's say the German government, Switzerland, Sweden, and some others, the European Union. Um, and we did fundraising in order to have some additional funding to be able to put together a robust process of consultation, of listening. 
And we did that for a year and you were part of that. And this report that you're presenting is actually one of the products of that process in which we got more than 200 written submissions from global indigenous people like you, uh, global unions, global business, uh, and more than 200 reports, many from governments, coalitions of different kinds, um, etc. And we organized um, more than 30 ad hoc consultations, and we were invited to more than 40 or almost 50 consultations that took place, including the ones organized by you, in order to listen. And, uh, and what we said from the very beginning is, we don't have solutions for all the challenges. We don't even know what, what all the challenges are. Um, we are a five of so-called experts that we do our best to try to interpret reality, try to find solutions that can work, but, but we actually don't have any silver bullet uh, and we will not make anything, uh, let's say situations that are historically bad, um, where there are legacies that are of really awful nature, let's say, like racism, for example, uh, to change overnight. So we will do our best effort to uh, understand and to listen and to capture the different perspectives and try to look into the future of what can we do. Um, we have here two uh, simultaneous narratives out of the stock taking exercise. One, a half full glass narrative which is mostly the one of governments. And if you follow the Human Rights Council uh, interactive dialogue of Monday and Tuesday, it was pretty much everything positive. And we had almost all governments of the world in one way or another in coalitions or individually saying that they are in favor of the guiding principles, that they like them, and that they, we, we should pursue this agenda forward with very little self-criticism, if any. Um, so that's one part. Business, in general, again, a positive narrative. We are making progress, we are embedding the guiding principles, we are conducting due diligence, we are understanding our impacts, we are shifting our policies, etc. And uh, so, and, and, and we know, of course, that that is a half full narrative, half full glass narrative, that falls very short from reality, but nevertheless is, is let's say, a perception from big business, industry associations and government that has a positive twist, that is a positive narrative that we are making to a certain extent progress and that, uh, and that we have more to be done into the future in a direction and a course that is somehow moving in the right direction. That's where we are regarding those two, let's say broadly speaking, constituencies. But then we have a parallel narrative which is civil society overall, indigenous people, unions, uh, that is more of a half empty glass uh, narrative. And, um, and of course it's based on the practical experience of unbalance of power, uh, weak implementation, high level of corruption, corporate capture of the state, disconnection between uh, policies and practices, disconnection between headquarter and subsidiary, uh, weak implementation on the ground, indicators that very often don't exist, and the practical experience of people like you or many of you that have suffered firsthand the consequences of negative impacts or weak governance uh, or governance failures. So we, we understand that, we, we listen to that, and we of course have observed that actually with my good friend Pavel, we have traveled together to um, Brazil and Mexico uh, to uh, conduct country visits. And we saw firsthand um, what happens to, to people on the ground, and especially indigenous people that uh, even in, in some countries are not legally uh, recognized even. So of course, the let's say absence of rights for rights holders is total since uh, many of you don't even exist legally. Um, so therefore we have, of course, um, let's say a, a picture of this half empty, half full. Um, and, and we need to combine them. So if you look at our report, which has a short version, what we, we try to do is capture these two perspectives, but have one positive twist that comes from our working group, which is, it is the same glass. 
it is the same glass that has the potential to be transformative. That's what we aim to, and it's foundational. So we have a common framework, we have common language, we have common principles. And we see with good eyes how we have been moving from almost exclusive soft law approach to a smart mix towards hard, the hard law. Um, and we like that approach, how, how it's evolving in a direction of hardening hard law. And we see a carrot or stick, let's say picture, and we will like to see the stick working and we will like to see the carrots growing in size because a big carrot is almost like uh, a stick, um, even if it's not, let's say, integrated into law. And what we also recognize is that just law, it will, will not be enough in context of weak governance, um, in context of corruption, in context of co corporate capture of the state. Therefore, we need a combination of measures that can take into account this reality, which is a mixed reality, but in where we can, we want, and I think we can move into a, a better um, uh, situation into the future. We will be working the next four months, um, and starting today, actually, that was the, the, the number one day until the 31st of October, in the roadmap. And we will need your help. Of course, we the report, we have it already. You make very specific recommendations that we would like to completely uh, and fully take on board. The, the right to self-determination, check. Let's say I buy it completely. That is very reasonable thing to aspire to ask. Uh, participation, consultation, and consent. Again, we agree with that. And, and is the basis for legitimacy for any kind of business operation without consent is, 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 is the end because you will be litigating around the corner. It will lack legitimacy and therefore is a project that shouldn't even fly uh, or an investment that shouldn't even fly without consent. The right to effect a remedy and redress I agree completely, um, which is nothing from another world. It's an expectation that is absolutely reasonable. And then where I have a little bit of an issue with the language that that uh, um, your, your colleagues have written is moving beyond the GPs, making it legally binding. And um, the GPs from the very beginning talk about a smart mix. It's true that at the beginning it was almost exclusively soft law but we're moving into a harder law uh, arena. And therefore, my suggestion only, uh, because of course, as your report, is to, to modify a little bit that piece of the narrative uh, to say, because it can be interpreted as leaving behind the guiding principles. And I will uh, advocate to actually keep pushing the guiding principles as they are the basis for more robust public policy uh, looking into the future, including the element of hard law, which we fully support in this logic of smart mix with companion policies that can actually incentivize uh, in those jurisdictions where rule of law is weak and where governance is weak to actually get on, uh, on board this respect for human rights and the indigenous people um, in particular. So the last observation, we know there is power imbalance. Um, we know that there is legacy, which is awful, and in all parts, many parts of the world, almost all parts of the world, certainly my part of the world and my own country. Uh, and very often we are uh, blind. The people that are in positions of power or authority, like is my case right now, uh, very often we're ignorant. We just don't get it, not because I don't want to. And, and actually, my friend Pavel has been uh, my guide in cap, cap, catching up in terms of indigenous people's rights and, and history, legacy, and the way forward. Um, because very often, we are simply ignorant that, and don't know how to move forward. So I look forward for this conversation. We'll remain in the full session. We'll be paying attention to you and invite you to participate actively in the process towards the roadmap. And, and the roadmap will be showcased in our 10th uh, annual forum of business and human rights in Geneva. Uh, and this will be the final work that I do for the working group. Since the 31st of October, I'll step down 
the, from the working group and will not be part of it any longer. But that will be, let's say, my, my last contribution is this wrap up of the roadmap and be able to present it uh, with your help. So thanks again very much. My pleasure. And I will remain here all ears and eyes um, for the rest of this event. And of course, you know where to find me and our secretariat as well and how to move forward into the next steps that I just uh, signaled to you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for, for these uh, encouraging opening remarks and also for your an analysis and acknowledgement of the challenges. We shall also try to recognize that the glass is also half full to some extent. Um, and thank you for your commitment uh, to take on our recommendations and keep us on board for, for the design of the, the roadmap. Um, we will, of course, take your uh, suggestions into consideration as well. Now, uh, let me turn to the next part of our session where we will get an overview of the main findings of the publication we are launching today by the authors, uh, Jose Alvin and Johannes Rohr. Uh, Jose Alvin is a human rights lawyer from the University of Chile in Santiago and has a Master of Law from the University of British Columbia. Jose has researched and published on human rights, ethnic and cultural diversity, environmental rights, as well as on business and human rights with different organizations, including IVIA. He teaches indigenous people's rights at the School of Law in Chile and currently acts as a coordinator for the globalization and human rights program of the Citizens Watch, a Chilean human rights NGO. And Johannes Rohr, the other author, is a German historian and human rights defender who has been working with indigenous peoples, in particular in Russia since the mid 90s. For several years, he has worked as IFGIA's Russia coordinator. And uh, after Pavel Suliansiga, whom we will hear from later, uh, got appointed to the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights in 2012, Johannes has been supporting uh, Pavel's work on the UN Guiding Principles uh, throughout his tenure. But after speaking out at the 2019 UN Forum on Business and Human Rights in Geneva on the situation of indigenous peoples in areas of oil and gas extraction in the Russian Arctic, he was banned from Russia for an unprecedented 50 years. So Johannes, uh, I turn to you now to give us a short background for the report. And again, this issue with unmuting yourself is, uh, you should get used to it by now, but I'm still having those glitches. Yeah, I guess I won't have to say that much on the background. Uh, I mean, it is, is indeed, I, I think one of the backgrounds for me was that maybe the glass isn't half full, but I was surprised to see that it's not totally empty. So that was, I guess, one of the big, um, takeaways from, from the reporting process for me. And this, this was to some extent uh, encouraging. And I guess I won't have to say very much on the backgrounds of the guiding principles because I mean, of the very um, good overview Dante gave now. But of course, it, we shouldn't forget that the guiding principles are only the latest attempt to impose uh, um, regulations or to somehow frame the human rights um, obligations or responsibilities or however you want to call them of uh, non-state actors of, of business enterprises who in many countries wield more economic and even political power than uh, the, the, the governments do. And this has actually been going on for half a century. So, so these attempts to, 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 to develop and impose regulations and uh, attempts to impose binding regulations have unfortunately all but failed until now. I mean, the last, I guess, well-known attempt was uh, the, the so-called draft norms. Uh, which were turned down by, by the Human Rights Commission in 2003, after which the guiding principles uh, were developed. And um, I mean, the, the, I think the, the interesting thing about the guiding principles, apart from that they are non-binding, is that they really try to try to marry the, the human rights language and the business language with this um, um, concept of human rights due diligence, because the, the, the concept of due diligence, of course, was, was well known and very familiar to any manager. But uh, the concept of human rights due diligence was uh, an innovation trying to transport uh, 
yeah, the, the, yeah, human rights concepts in, into business concepts. Yeah, of course, since they are non-binding, the, the, the guiding principles were met by indigenous peoples with a whole lot of skepticism and there wasn't really a huge uh, expectation towards them in, in the very beginning. And still we found that there has been a, a dynamic emerging in recent years at, at various fronts, mostly at policy levels, but still I think it's something noticeable has been going on. And so it has been quite worthwhile to take stock and to do that at, at, at any level, both at the policy level, but also to look at what has actually been, has anything changed on the ground for the better, for the worse. Yeah. And yeah, that's basically, I mean, so, so our purpose was not so much in, um, yeah, less in recommendations, but really in, in, in uh, assessing what has happened in the meantime. And I hope that this report uh, to some extent has uh, lived up to its uh, purpose. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, thank you for that, Johannes. And uh, building on to that, uh, I would like to ask uh, Jose, after 10 years of implementation, what progress have you identified with regards to the implementation of the UN Guiding Principles? Bueno, antes que nada, buenos días, buenas tardes a todos y mis agradecimientos en especial a los eh, comentaristas por acompañarnos en este evento. Eh, uno de los acentos del, del informe fue mapear los avances eh, que han existido en la implementación de los principios rectores en relación a los derechos de pueblos indígenas. Y constatamos que a pesar de las muchas brechas de las que vamos a hablar, y se constatan en el informe, también observamos avances. Eh, eh, primeramente, los estados eh, han avanzado de diversas formas. Eh, en los planes de acción nacional sobre eh, derechos humanos y empresas, identificamos que al menos en 13 de los 24 de ellos se hace referencia explícita a los derechos de pueblos indígenas a pesar de que eh, tanto en la elaboración de ellos como la implementación, la participación indígena fue eh, pobre. También identificamos legislaciones, marcos normativos sobre consultas, sobre protección de las tierras eh, en distintos estados de África, Asia y América Latina. Eh, en la perspectiva que señalaba Dante, ¿no es cierto?, de hacer... Eh, um, vinculante eh, la responsabilidad de las empresas, observamos que Francia, Alemania, Países Bajos han introducido o están en proceso de introducir eh, debida de diligencia obligatoria en derechos humanos, lo que podría beneficiar a pueblos indígenas impactados por empresas de esos países. Lo mismo, un proceso análogo en la Unión Europea que podría conducir a un instrumento de la misma naturaleza. En América Latina eh, destacamos el Acuerdo de Escazú, que reconoce el derecho al acceso a la información en materia ambiental, participación y justicia, eh, con expresa referencia a pueblos indígenas. En cuanto a los mecanismos de reparación de daños provocados por empresas, eh, eh, los mecanismos judiciales eh, siguen siendo eh, um, pobres en, en, en la recepción de los reclamos indígenas, con algunos fallos relevantes eh, destacando el consentimiento libre, previo, informado en países como Colombia y Canadá, en otros el derecho de consulta como en Nepal e India. Eh, destacamos el rol de los institutos nacionales de derechos humanos, que han sido claves en documentar, litigar en favor de derechos de pueblos indígenas. Destacamos su labor. En cuanto a las empresas, destacamos en particular las iniciativas multiactor. Eh, las que a pesar de sus deficiencias y que no eh, suplantan el rol del Estado, eh, con, con, observamos que eh, grandes empresas del rubro de alimentos y bebidas, de minería eh, y también del ámbito de la forestación han incorporado eh, los principios rectores y en particular el consentimiento libre, previo e informado. Sin embargo, observamos también que en su aplicación práctica no siempre es eh, consistente con esos principios. Eh, destacamos eh, el, el impacto importante que han tenido los principios rectores transversal al sistema de Naciones Unidas y todos sus órganos, 
eh, la Relatoría Especial de eh, Derechos de Pueblos Indígenas, la FAO, eh, los órganos de tratado que han desarrollado y se han basado en estos principios rectores para eh, um, aplicarlos a situaciones de afectación de derechos, por, eh, de derechos de pueblos indígenas por empresa. Y valoramos de manera muy especial el grupo de trabajo intergubernamental sobre empresas transnacionales y otras empresas comerciales para elaborar este instrumento vinculante sobre el cual ya se hacía referencia. También destacamos el sistema interamericano, que ha su jurisprudencia, sus eh, eh, pri, estándares a través de documentos específicos, se han basado en los principios rectores y lo han aplicado eh, eh, para el caso de los pueblos indígenas frente a las extractivas en un continente donde las extractivas han tenido gran impacto eh, en esta materia. Destacamos la, el rol de las organizaciones de sociedad civil, están señaladas ahí, no hay tiempo para hacerlo, pero sin ellas es muy posible que eh, la brecha en la implementación, eh, en la documentación, en la visibilización, por ejemplo, de la criminalización de defensores indígenas hubiese sido muy eh, superior. Y, por cierto, el rol de los pueblos indígenas en la defensa de sus derechos eh, internacionalmente reconocidos, en los protocolos eh, de consentimiento libre, previo e informado, más de 50 eh, a nivel mundial, que han sido centrales para eh, garantizar la protección. Algunos de esos protocolos han sido acogidos por, y aceptados por los tribunales de justicia en diversas regiones del planeta. Yeah, thank you for that. It, it does indeed seem that the glass is not completely empty. <laughs> uh, but uh, maybe, Johannes, you could share a few uh, of the key gaps and challenges that were identified when working on the report. Yeah, and not unexpectedly, I mean, the, 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 the overarching substantial gap that we found in many places is, of course, that there's a huge uh, gap between the policy level Uh, and, and, and practice on the ground. So that's, that's a very general remark, which is probably applicable like almost everywhere um, with very few exceptions. And also, I mean, this is also old news that, that uh, indigenous peoples remain disproportionately affected by extractive industries uh, and the like, and also by, by yeah, uh, hydropower and, and many other extractive activities, which includes uh, some uh, relatively new, new drivers, such as, uh, yeah, unfortunately, also the, the, the emergence of, of the green economy is not, is not without problems also, because electromobility also drives certain, certain um, types of, of mining, which, which might, may have, uh, yeah, if conducted without due respect of indigenous rights, very, very negative impacts. Um, And we do see, we do see, I mean, it's, this is not something we have found out, it's more something we, what, what, what IPRI has been working on, Indigenous People's Rights International, the, the, the growing tendency of, of both criminalization of Indigenous human rights defenders, including, of course, killings, unfortunately, many of them in, in Central America. Um, and, uh, but also uh, in places where people are not being killed, um, spaces for civil society may also be shrinking in authoritarian countries such as Russia where yeah you're not getting shot but you, but 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 the spaces for civil society are still rapidly shrinking so that many human rights defenders have left the country um, yeah and then there's uh, The, the, there, there's a big disillusionment often about the practice of FPIC and consultation. Uh, as I guess most of us know, uh, most uh, Latin American countries have uh, signed on to the ILO Convention 169, um, which uh, obliges them to, uh, to, to, to um, respect the right of indigenous peoples to free prior informed consent. And some of them have actually passed consultation laws, but uh, most of those are Usually those consultation laws are very, very limited and uh, the practice of a free prior informed consent as it's, it is uh, directed either by governments or by, uh, by companies tries to reduce it to a mere compliance mechanism, to a mere box uh, ticking exercise 
and tries to decouple it from the right to self-determination of indigenous peoples. And then there are many other gaps, but, but maybe one, one final that I would like to highlight is the continuing issue of international investment agreements of secret courts, uh, which have no cause of appeal, uh, which uh, undermine um, national legislation, including national ec ecological and human rights legislation. And for, for more gaps, you really have to read the report. Yeah, thank you. Sorry, we don't have so much time uh, to bring out all these uh, great things from the report. But uh, Jose, maybe you could briefly highlight uh, some of the key conclusions of the report. Bueno, en la misma línea que señalaba Johannes, constatamos que lamentablemente, a, a pesar de la aceptación universal de los principios rectores por todos los actores, estos no alteraron sustancialmente la desprotección en que los pueblos indígenas se encuentran frente a la actividad eh, empresarial. No, nuestra interpretación es que eh, en la operatividad de estos actores eh, no se aceptaron Eh, no se asumieron los contenidos de la Declaración de Naciones Unidas sobre derechos de pueblo indígena, ni la interpretación que la OIT hace del, de los derechos del Convenio 169. Eh, concluimos también que los estados no han cumplido a cabalidad su obligación de proteger los derechos de pueblos indígenas, por las razones que ya se ha señalado. Lo mismo, las empresas no han adoptado o no adoptaron medidas suficientes para asumir su responsabilidad y evitar la afectación de derechos de pueblo indígena. Igualmente, que no eh, eh, ni los estados ni las empresas establecieron mecanismos eh, plenamente efectivos para asegurar, eh, para prevenir las violaciones y para reparar los daños causados por, por las empresas. Consideramos en este sentido que en el informe, y nos eh, expandimos en ello, que... Eh, para que los pueblos, derechos de pueblos indígenas se encuentren efectivamente protegidos en los próximos 10 años, eh, hay que asumir más plenamente todos estos actores el derecho a la autodeterminación, el consentimiento libre, previo e informado como derechos centrales frente a la actividad de las empresas. Y hay que reforzar los mecanismos judiciales y extrajudiciales. Y por último, concluimos eh, en esta reflexión que ya eh, a la cual Dante hacía referencia, no se trata de sustituir los principios rectores, tal vez hay un tema ahí de traducción, pero sí de eh, complementar los principios rectores con la urgente elaboración y aprobación de un instrumento jurídico vinculante que regule las actividades de empresas transnacionales y otras empresas y que permita hacer efectiva la responsabilidad no solo de los estados, sino que también de las empresas eh, frente a la vulneración de derechos de pueblos indígenas eh, que, come, que cometen. Right, thank you so much, Jose. Uh, finally, Johannes, very short. Could you give us an overview of the key recommendations included in the report? Yeah, I've really wondered how short I can actually be because there's really, I mean, though this recommendations part is, is, is quite, quite detailed. Um, so maybe just to pick out a few is, uh, I mean, the, 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 the keyword FPIC has been mentioned several times now, but I think what, what hasn't been mentioned, uh, I've been following the translation, so I don't know if, if, if I missed something, um, was uh, that, that states have to ensure not only that they respect the right to FPIC, but, but practically this means that they have to um, acknowledge and, and, and follow indigenous people's own uh, FPIC protocols or autonomous FPIC protocols, um, as we have observed that they are they ha really have the potential to 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 substantially affect the situation on the ground and to substantially contribute to to better respect and 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 protection of indigenous people's rights. So that would be absolutely key moment a moment for for us. I think um, a, a second issue which which I think uh, also if, uh, regards most states is that uh, while there has been the, the working group has has put a strong emphasis on on the potential of national action plans um, as, as as a means to implement the guiding principles locally uh, most national action plans with 
one exception, have not uh, um, had uh, proper consultations with indigenous peoples. I think there's one example in in Peru currently where, where the government has uh, had some degree of consultation, although this has also been far from perfect. Uh, so this would be another I mean, that, that would actually be both in the same direction that, that the right to consultation and consent really has to be respected and, and, and fulfilled at all levels. Um, maybe since we have very uh, little time, I think this, this combating killings, killings and violence is also a very important recommendation which we have. And um, for, for international organizations, I think I would like to just mention one which is that the, the open-ended working group, uh, which is currently developing the binding treaty on business and human rights, really has to take care that, they, that, that indigenous people's rights uh, are not overlooked in this, in this um, uh, process and in, uh, in the development of the, of the binding instrument. And uh, yeah, what regards corporations, uh, we also put at the very first place uh, the, the need to respect indigenous people's right to free by informed consent and to, to respect and follow uh, the FPIC protocols that indigenous peoples have themselves developed in order to ensure that FPIC isn't just a word or not just a fancy abbreviation, but really a practice of, of mutual trust and, and long-term relationship. Um, and yeah, finally, to indigenous peoples themselves. Uh, I mean, again, we have plenty of recommendations, but I just would, would uh, highlight again, I, I think the, 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 the same issue of FPIC that, that indigenous peoples sh should really look at the examples of, of successfully developed and implemented FPIC protocols, uh, which exist mostly in Latin America, but also in other parts of the world and uh, try to strengthen their institutions and, and try to further develop uh, their own FPIC protocols, maybe with the help of allies, because we, we really saw that these, this is a very promising instrument. And also what I think really needs to happen is that, that indigenous peoples really get more, more present and more involved in, the, in the, the, the process around the development of the binding treaty which I guess will continue for many, many more years. I mean, it's probably going to take at least as long as the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples took, so like a quarter of, cent of a century. So it really takes, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's really something that you, where you can't expect immediate results, but I think it's still, it's very important to, to stay involved there. Yeah. And maybe with that, I, th this very incomplete list, because there are many, many more recommendations in the report, I would just uh, finish and uh, hand back the floor. Thank you, Johannes. I think you, you did manage to touch on some very important recommendations. And I do encourage everyone to really look into the report itself for the full list. Uh, but thank you both for uh, giving us this overview of the findings of the report and the recommendations. Um, and next, I'm excited that we will be getting some inputs from our indigenous representatives from the different regions. And we will start in Latin America, where I'm pleased to introduce our first panelist, uh, Luis Vitor, who for many years has offered support and assistance to community leaders, organizations, and networks of indigenous peoples in Peru and also in the broader Andean region of South America and more recently on the regional level in Latin America. Currently, he is an advisor to the coordinators and board of directors of the FIAI, a network of organizations and networks of indigenous peoples in Latin America. So, uh, Vitor, could you, from a regional uh, perspective, uh, give us your assessment on what has happened in relation to the implementation of the UN Guiding Principles and the protection of indigenous people's rights? Muchísimas gracias. Buenos días desde, desde Perú y buenas tardes seguramente en, en otras partes y buenas noches también en, en otras latitudes. En efecto, los pueblos indígenas de América Latina mantenemos vivas nuestras expectativas por los procesos y las normas internacionales que pueden cambiar las historias de exclusión y de constantes vulneraciones a los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. ¿no? 
estamos en constante movilización para que los estados y otros actores cumplan con sus obligaciones de proteger y respetar los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. ¿no? Los impactos negativos de las actividades de las empresas sobre los derechos de los pueblos indígenas en nuestra región no es un problema reciente. ¿no? Muchos pueblos tienen décadas buscando reparación por las afectaciones a su territorio y medios de subsistencia. Por ello, la adopción de los principios rectores sobre empresas y derechos humanos llamó la atención de los pueblos indígenas afectados por eh, las actividades de las empresas a la espera de que su aplicación contribuyera a, a la solución de sus demandas. ¿no? Debemos reconocer que en nuestra región y en la última década muchos actores, incluyendo los pueblos indígenas, se han movilizado alrededor de la cuestión de las empresas y los derechos humanos con base a los principios rectores y otros instrumentos internacionales y regionales. ¿no? Por ejemplo, los pueblos indígenas y las organizaciones de la sociedad civil han realizado múltiples actividades de difusión de los principios rectores, de capacitación, de diálogo con otros actores. También hemos participado en los foros regionales sobre empresas y derechos humanos y las visitas al grupo de trabajo encargado de, de promover la aplicación de los principios rectores cuando han visitado los países de la región. Eh, eh, también nos hemos, por ejemplo, reunido alrededor de los cinco foros regionales sobre empresas y derechos humanos llevados a cabo desde 2013, donde los pueblos indígenas hemos tenido la oportunidad de compartir nuestras perspectivas. También nos hemos movilizado en el marco de la visita del grupo de trabajo a la región, por ejemplo, en los casos recientes de Honduras, Perú, México y Brasil. ¿no? Durante estas visitas, los pueblos indígenas Hablaron de los impactos de las actividades de las empresas sobre sus derechos y como resultado de estas visitas, el grupo de trabajo entregó uh, varios informes con referencias a la situación de los pueblos indígenas afectados y una lista de recomendaciones a los gobiernos. ¿no? Aquí sería de mucha utilidad, tal vez en el futuro, un mecanismo que pueda verificar el cumplimiento de estas recomendaciones. ¿no? Ahí eh, creo que hay un, un primer desafío, un primer reto. ¿no? Por otro lado, en el ámbito de la región, eh, y, y identificamos que uno de, de los avances eh, de, en la aplicación de los principios rectores, en efecto, son los planes nacionales de acción sobre empresas y derechos humanos. Aquí podemos decir que de un total de 33 estados, por ejemplo, que conforman el Grupo Regional de América Latina y el, y el Caribe, el GRULAC, solo tres países cuentan con planes aprobados, son los casos de Colombia, Chile y recientemente Perú. Argentina entendemos que logró elaborar un plan, pero eh, aún no está aprobado, ¿no? Mientras que México ha incluido acciones sobre empresas y derechos humanos, así como sobre pueblos indígenas en el Programa Nacional de Derechos Humanos eh, aprobado el, el año pasado, ¿no? En relación a los planes nacionales, nos hemos preguntado sobre la participación de los pueblos indígenas en su elaboración e implementación, ¿no? En el caso de Perú, nos consta y también consta a Dante hace unos días en la presentación que eh, de la participación eh, en la elaboración a través de ocho organizaciones indígenas y que éstas también formarán parte del seguimiento a la implementación del plan. ¿no? En el caso de Chile, en el documento del 2017 se menciona que en su elaboración hubo diálogos participativos con actores, entre ellos los pueblos indígenas. Asimismo, participarían del Comité de Seguimiento e Implementación del Plan, aunque en el documento y en el sitio web del, del Ministerio encargado de, de promover su aplicación, no se especifica la representación indígena en este espacio. ¿no? En el caso de Colombia, eh, no se menciona la participación indígena en la elaboración, pero sí se incluye que tienen espacio de participación en la implementación, aunque las organizaciones indígenas no han nominado la, la participación eh, eh, en este espacio. ¿no? Asimismo, nos preguntamos si los planes nacionales incluyen medidas específicas en relación a los pueblos indígenas. Aquí podemos decir que en el caso de Colombia, en el último documento aprobado en, el, en diciembre del 2020, aparece apenas una referencia a los pueblos indígenas. Eh, en, eh, y se refiere a la implementación del mejoramiento de, de infraestructura vial a las comunidades. ¿no? En el caso de Chile, identificamos al menos eh, nueve acciones de eh, relacionadas con capacitación en derechos humanos y, y, y empresas, 
diálogo, participación, consulta en proyectos de energía y en el caso peruano, al menos 10 acciones que se refieren a los pueblos indígenas, entre otras en capacitación sobre los principios rectores, participación en la elaboración de diversas guías temáticas y una propuesta de mejora de la consulta previa. ¿no? Eh, estas acciones son suficientes para proteger los derechos de los pueblos indígenas, a juzgar por las propias organizaciones y los pueblos indígenas son insuficientes y hasta observan la ausencia de acciones orientadas a proteger sus derechos. ¿no? Por ejemplo, en el caso peruano, las organizaciones indígenas que participaron del proceso de elaboración del plan mencionaron que apenas una de sus propuestas fue incluida en el plan aprobado, ¿no? Y se refieren a la consulta previa, ¿no? Y demandan que se incorpore, por ejemplo, acciones para proteger el derecho al territorio, a la consulta previa libre e informada, así como acciones de reparación por las afectaciones a los pueblos indígenas, ¿no? Otro asunto que se reclama a nivel general es que, por ejemplo, los, estos planes pudieran ser sometidos a consulta a los pueblos indígenas, ¿no? Entonces, Reconociendo estos avances eh, eh, y esta movilización que ha habido en los estados, los organismos internacionales regionales, por ejemplo, a los que José se refirió en, en, su, en su intervención, el grupo de trabajo, las empresas, la sociedad civil, los pueblos indígenas en relación al, al tema de empresas y derechos humanos, todavía podemos ver que eh, las vulneraciones a los derechos de los pueblos indígenas todavía subsisten, están vigentes, digamos. Estamos seguros que la situación de los pueblos indígenas descrita, por ejemplo, en los informes de las visitas del grupo de trabajo, poco o nada ha cambiado en el terreno. ¿no? Otra pista de esta situación podría ser, por ejemplo, una revisión rápida de las comunicaciones que hay de diversos mandatos del sistema de procedimientos especiales del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. ¿no? Que en lo que hemos nosotros visto que desde el 2011 al menos 20 de estas comunicaciones provienen de países de la región o involucran afectaciones a los pueblos indígenas por las actividades de las empresas o están relacionadas con las actividades de las empresas. ¿no? Otra cuestión que nos queda claro es que desde la mirada de los pueblos indígenas en los planes nacionales se requieren medidas más concretas, más fuertes, ¿no? sobre todo en los pilares de proteger y acceso a reparación. ¿no? Muchos pueblos indígenas esperan reparación por las consecuencias negativas de las actividades de las empresas sobre, de, sobre sus derechos y esto sin duda requiere una acción inmediata. ¿no? Aquí las instituciones nacionales de derechos humanos pueden cumplir un rol determinante en investigar y recomendar a los estados y las empresas las medidas de reparación. ¿no? Finalmente, en el pilar de respetar, consideramos que se necesitan que las empresas nos muestren resultados de cómo están respetando los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. ¿no? Y para concluir, podemos decir que una década después de la adopción de los principios rectores, es todavía un desafío comprender y eh, aplicar los principios rectores para proteger los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Muchísimas gracias. Thank you so much, uh, Luis, for this uh, assessment from the Latin American region. Uh, clearly, a lot has been done by many different actors, uh, but there is still a huge uh, gap to ensure the rights of indigenous peoples to be respected uh, in any business and company ventures. Um, so let's uh, move on to the next region. Uh, let's turn to Africa, where I'm pleased to introduce our next panelist, uh, Mali Ole Kaunga, who is a Laikipia Masai and the founder and director of an organization called IMPACT, Indigenous Movement for Peace, Advancement and Conflict Transformation. Uh, the organization exists to organize, build and strengthen indigenous people's social movements at the grassroots in northern Kenya. IMPACT's focus areas include what they call indigenous people's five R's, rights, resources, recognition, respect, and representation in relation to securing land and natural resource rights, policy dialogue, promoting broad legal and human rights, promoting responsible investments and strengthening indigenous people's responses to climate risks and injustices and strengthening indigenous people's movements. Ole Kaunga is a global indigenous leader and activist. So we are looking forward to give Uh, to your uh, regional assessment on the implementation of the UN guiding principles and protection of indigenous people's rights in Africa. Over to you, Mali Olekaunga. 
Thank you, everyone. And uh, <clears throat> I'm pleased to be here to share my regional exp uh, experiences with regard to the implementation of the United Nations regarding principles. Yeah, I, I think it has been very slow for Africa in terms of traction, in terms of implementation of the guiding principles. But there are, there are a number of, uh, there are a number of uh, progress in, in relation to states. Uh, I think uh, a number of governments are struggling uh, with the question of uh, improving their policies and laws. Uh, and others have made uh, some, some attempts to come up with the national action plans. And I think Kenya, could be one of them that has an action, a national action plan on business and human rights. From the African Commission uh, and Human Rights, you, we've seen a number of uh, visit, country visits that have, uh, that have really uh, engaged, uh, raised the profile of the issues at the country level, but also at the commission level. So we see that as a space, an opening space that uh, indigenous people have been able to engage on also government has been able to to begin some country uh, initiatives in terms of progress we've also seen a growth uh, a growth in terms of uh, a number of uh, we see of late that there have been a tremendous level of, uh, of uh, research from universities uh, and a number of other research institutions specifically focusing on the impacts of extractive industries and other businesses on indigenous people, right? which, which aim to generate and inform about the impacts of these uh, businesses. We also have seen uh, uh, cutting across a, a number of uh, investors or a number of uh, businesses with an, an attempt to come up with their own kind of uh, guidelines or uh, kind of a grievance mechanisms uh, 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 not to say that they are effective, but we see a positive, in, 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 a, a positive in, in, in where we see government, and I mean companies, coming up with our grievance mechanisms. Uh, on other, uh, on, uh, within within that same strat, we also see a growing a growing the increase, the increase of public uh, public private kind of uh, partnerships. In where government enters into partnerships with other, with other, uh, uh, or even government themselves, uh, because of the increase uh, and because of the the demand of uh, resources for for industries, we see a number of increasing number of uh, investments and also towards the direction of the extractives. And on the other hand, uh, for us uh, across and specifically for indigenous people. We've seen the rise of a corporate activism, where corporates are using different forms of uh, platforms to really inform the global public, the regional public, and how good their uh, their approaches are through either media, through this kind of a uh, sponsorship of uh, corporate social responsibilities, but uh, uh, as a way an attempt. To overshadow the negative, uh, the negative image of where in, in investments on businesses have really gained over the last couple of years. So for Africa, um, uh, that is uh, the kind of a, a growing, uh, a growing, uh, 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 continue to grow uh, with respect to demands by communities and other. But we also see a lot of land-based, land-based investments that impacts and push people to the actually to the edge of survival uh, because much of the investment coming is either targeting land uh, so we see the gains uh, that the climate uh, the climate uh, the party agreement the gains that are, are being attempted uh, for the climate change are being re minimized reduced from the other aspect of the climate and of, of, uh, of business and human rights issues so you realize that for instance uh, for a good example will be you will see this uh, this logging going on, uh, for instance, in DRC Congo, uh, while the world is trying to increase the old question of about uh, the old question about increasing uh, forest cover. So we see some of the competing interests, in, even in, even some some of the competing uncoordinated efforts uh, within the UN system, but also uh, from within the business like. Uh, what is uh, then? There, there are a number of three. Uh, there are a number of critical issues that remain: the increase 
of uh, criminalization of indigenous people life. The increase of killings, uh, especially around the Congo Basin, in relation to logging or conservation. We see increase in human rights abuses. We see increase in a number uh, of, apostively, we see a number of communities, a number of indigenous people trying, organizing themselves and utilize free prior informed consent. So one of the positive, one of the positive impact of the UN United Nations Guide principles has actually, they, 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 it has raised a whole question about free informed consent and people, communities are really trying to engage it. They are trying to use it to defend themselves, to defend their territories. Uh, uh, they are, uh, so, but the other thing also with the increase of organization trying to raise their grievance mechanism, the voluntary guidelines has not worked. Uh, and it, it is not anticipated that it will work because uh, it's a, a kind of a, um, we, we, we are expecting companies to, uh, to revary themselves. So we don't see really much in, in terms of positivity of that. Um, so uh, the other issue, uh, the other issue that uh, I, I can see across, uh, across the region is uh, this increasing indigenous peoples organizing uh, to raise their voice globally, regionally, and to link this issue to other, uh, to other, global, uh, to other global indigenous peoples movements. And uh, uh, this is actually one way of uh, building solidarity with them. And, uh, and for sure, uh, uh, one thing that remains is that our indigenous territories are still continuing to evade. And, uh, but the, and the bigger question is, um, the bigger question is, uh, we, uh, how do we really make the voluntary guidelines really work uh, because there's no any legal backing within the countries where, where the impact is? And also for countries like Kenya that have their national action plan uh, on business and human rights in place, it's still a soft, it's still a, a, another, it's a good thing to have it. It's a good thing to have it, but is it, is, there, is it not just a public relations, especially using that they are not really government driven. We know that this, some of these uh, documents, so some of these processes are being funded from outside. They are no, uh, we also see institutions like national human rights institutions, uh, like Kenya, Kenya National Commission on Human Rights or South African Human Rights Commission. These are publicly funded entities. But if you look at it, the amount of resources being put there from the parliament, or for, they have no, they have minimal resources. They have to be funded externally uh, because uh, uh, it is, there's a way, there's an element of kind of a toggle because they're independent commissions. So they really do not have that uh, capacity. So they have to raise resources externally. Uh, uh, so are, are they really independent commissions? If they, they if they cannot get adequate budgets from their own government to be able to articulate, and they are all the only in Africa, they are the only kind of uh, uh, avenues for for communities for uh, for indigenous people specifically uh, to to drive their complaints. If you look at the amount of cases, in the amount amount of cases uh, being handled by the National, Kenya National Commission, for instance, they are very high, and I think that's another. On a positive note. I think the whole the United Nations guiding, guiding principles also created a number of international kind of. Uh, this a recent case in which uh, a community sued one of the multinationals in, in back in London, uh, and they won the case. Uh, uh, so I think there are a number of positive. Uh, there are a number of other positive developments by, by communities knowing that they can actually articulate their issues. So for of, for Africa, those are some of the issues, but. The, I think there are some of the recommendations that, that we bring forward will be um, actually to ensure that um, to find a mechanism of making the voluntary uh, uh, guidance uh, mm -hmm. to hold companies responsible because it will take time for the for the uh, for the treaty to come to play. So thank you so much for that uh, for the time. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Uh... Mali Oleka Unga, it's clearly that there are still very serious human rights violations going on and a lot of efforts also to, to use the UN guiding principles to counter these. Um, let's see if the situation is uh, different in Asia, where uh, I'm pleased to introduce uh, Guangchun Liu Gangmei, who is a Naga indigenous woman 
Guangchun works with the Asia Indigenous Peoples Pact as the program coordinator for the Human Rights Campaign and Policy Advocacy Program. Her interests lie primarily on the subjects of indigeneity, indigenous peoples movements, indigenous data sovereignty, land rights, and indigenous human rights defenders. Guangchun, we are looking forward to your assessment from Asia. Over to you. Thank you so much, Sini. I'll attempt to give an overview of what is happening in Asia and my counterparts from Asia can also fill in later. So um, yes, the UN guiding principles uh, provide us with authoritative framework and key tools for states and business to protect, respect human rights and access to remedy for victims. If you look at the, uh, in Asia on the dissemination and implementation of UN guiding principles, uh, we lag behind um, as compared to other parts of the world. But some progress have been made to implement the UNGPs in the recent past. If you look um, at it, uh, Thailand and Japan have adopted standalone national action plans on business and human rights, while India, Malaysia, Indonesia, Vietnam, Pakistan, and Mongolia are in the process of developing a national action plan. South Korea has inserted a chapter on business and human rights in its human rights action plan and various other states in the region have introduced guidance policies and legislations to promote business respect for human rights. India uh, also released national guidelines for responsible business conduct in early 2019. The governments of Nepal and Maldives are considering including sections on business and human rights in the national action plans on human rights. No, Non-state initiatives to promote the implementation of the UNGPs, including by the private sector, are underway in several states, including Bangladesh and Sri Lanka. Although there has been significant debate about the values of NAPs in, as a means of promoting business and human rights process, um, but they have been providing important focal points for promotion of the agenda, though not enough. Uh, in some cases, we also see increasing awareness among businesses of the responsibility to respect human rights. But um, of course, if you look at it closely, we have seen that both states and business um, critical implementation gaps remain and the participation of IPs in these processes are never substantive or non-existent. As is evident from uh, the reports that our counterparts have been providing from Thailand on the process of, um, um, of, of the adoption of national action plans. And um, at the later part where they adopted, um, the recommendations from the IPs were not included in the national action plan. So in, um, in, as it's also pointed out in this report, there is a vast gap between policies and declarations on one hand and the practice on the ground on the other. In many countries and sectors in the region, the influence of international human rights norms is constrained by powerful linkages between states and business interest as have also raised by other uh, panelists here. And the transnational business activity remains an important driver of economic growth and development in Asia. While offering some parts of population new economic opportunities, pathways out of poverty, significant human rights challenges in business operations continue with continuing barriers to access to effective remedies. When we look at the context of the indigenous peoples vis-a-vis uh, vis -vis business, the indigenous peoples of Asia are high up on the list of targets and victims of human rights violations. The trend of indigenous peoples rights violations is expected to worsen as the government continues to centralize and consolidate its powers and pursues its new liberal economic development program. Indigenous peoples occupy lands rich in natural resources, which is already established by other panels as well. Uh, that are valuable for business operations. However, their rights, including their lands, territories, and resources, and free prior informed consent are very often not recognized and effectively implemented in business context. This results in profoundly negative human rights impacts, including forced evictions, resettlement, loss of land resources, and livelihoods of indigenous peoples. 
When indigenous peoples fight back, they face extreme reprisals and risks such as harassment, attacks, disappearances, violence against women, and killings of indigenous leaders and human rights defenders. Worse, lack of access to remedy or justice for human rights abuses continue as a daunting challenge for the affected indigenous community. The informal trend analysis of human rights violations of indigenous peoples reported in our indigenous peoples human rights defenders network of AIPP, business activities in order of mining, agribusiness, energy projects, real estate tourism causes the most violations of land and resources rights and against indigenous human rights defenders. Environmental conservation undertakings such as national parks and false climate change solutions and infrastructural developments are, such as mega dams or other contributions for rights abuses. These activities are usually accompanied by militarization um, and heavy use of security forces to tackle opposition, which results in more violations. Um, our database in the EIPP have recorded 354 cases uh, from 2019 to, um, to till date. And um, as, um, um, and, of this, uh, we have recorded 150 cases from Bangladesh and 100 cases on, uh, from Philippines, and then uh, followed by India, Nepal, Indonesia, Thailand, Cambodia, Myanmar, and Malaysia. Of this, um, uh, our um, informal analysis uh, points to the direction of um, violations in the um, context of land, territories, and resources that stands maximum at 199, uh, 119 cases recorded during this period. So uh, apart from that, there has been um, um, uh, gross violations on um, and uh, repression on civil civic spaces uh, and, uh, and promote false solutions to deny justice across Asia. And in, in the COVID-19 context, also we have seen a lot of solutions and detrimental laws and policies being passed. As indicative, we, uh, in Indonesia, the omnibus laws, and in India, uh, the enactment of um, uh, uh, amendment of section 8A of Mines, Minerals and Regulations Act, um, which, weakens the, um, which weakens the public hearings and consultative processes. Um, this shows that there is extreme gap in implementation on huge challenges that we have ahead of us. So I think um, there needs to be um, a substantive collaborative process, network building, socialization, and learning as a means of constructive common knowledge base surrounding business and human rights and influencing the beliefs and behaviors of business and government actors. So uh, as a recommendation, which was published in one of the AIPP um, um, briefing paper last year, and I think it's still relevant, is uh, for the state to pass national laws to implement the UN guiding principles on business and human rights, including introducing binding human rights due diligence legislation to ensure companies conduct independent human rights, social and environmental risk and impact assessment act on their findings and commit to transparency with the results to adopt measures to ensure all, including meaningful consultations using FPIC framework with indigenous peoples among other groups whose human rights can be potentially affected. And for the business to recognize and respect the human rights defenders and the collective rights of indigenous peoples and act to promote or support indigenous um, or community led development priorities introduce human rights due diligence policies and procedures, including environmental, social, cultural, and other impact assessment, integrating mandatory requirements at the upper management as well as field levels. Uh, the other um, important, um, um, and in this, this challenging environment also is to continue progress towards implementation of business and human rights agenda uh, also demands a sustained focus on creating and defending political and civic spaces um, through the pro-rights actors inside and outside of the state can generate substantive uh, pressure for change. Uh, thanks, Sine. Over to you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Guang Chun, for sharing your assessment with us. Uh, I think it's especially worrying how uh, 
also the private sector is increasingly militarized in some Asian countries, um, but a lot of uh, important points raised here. Now we are running uh, behind schedule, so I'm afraid we won't be able to make the question and answer section, but if you have burning questions, we might be able to forward them to the panelists afterwards. Um, but uh, we are also very much interested in hearing uh, some perspectives on what is needed to advance, advance the implementation of indigenous people's rights. How do we go from policy development to implementation on the ground? And to answer this uh, question, or at least to reflect on it, uh, I'm pleased to introduce to you our next speaker, uh, Pavel Sulianziga, an indigenous uh, Udege from Russia, and uh, Pavel is the chairperson of the board of the International Development Fund of Indigenous Peoples in Russia. And he's currently a visiting scholar at Dartmouth U uh, College in the US. Uh, he was also um, a member of the Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and also a member of the UN Working Group on Business and Human Rights. Pavel, we look forward to hear your uh, reflections on how we move on from, from the policy level to the implementation. Over to you. Во-первых, я хотел бы всех поприветствовать. Я очень рад всех вас видеть. Спасибо большое за приглашение. Принять участие в обсуждении очень важного вопроса. Здесь уже вот мой друг и коллега Данте говорил о том, что очень важно, чтобы мы пришли к цели, когда нарушения вот этих руководящих принципов будут считаться незаконными, нелегальными. То есть и это, я думаю, что важная цель вот для того, чтобы достичь результатов по реализации руководящих принципов ООН по бизнесу и правам человека. Здесь вот очень хороший, образный Данте представил по поводу стакан наполовину пустыс или стакан наполовину полон. Я думаю, что на самом деле это очень, очень интересное сравнение. У меня есть еще вот несколько сравнений да, по тому, что происходит с руководящими принципами, с, ее, с их реализациями. Это примерно как если человеку дать вилку. Да? Один человек будет этой вилкой пользоваться, чтобы удобно покушать, да? другой этой вилкой исколит себя или других. Да? Третий эту вилку сделают золотой и будут носиться с ней как э, с какой-то иконой и так далее. Также происходит, к сожалению, вот, э, реализация этих руководящих принципов. Э, я участвовал в ряде вебинаров в последнее время и вижу, что по некоторым странам успехи очень большие. Конечно, проблем очень много. Да? Но они взяли эти руководящие принципы и начали их реализовывать, начали двигаться в сторону их реализации. По многим другим странам, к сожалению, видно, да, что эти руководящие принципы были либо ими выброшены, либо просто использованы как пиар. И, конечно, это очень большая проблема. Другой такой образный пример, который я тоже уже приводил, мы с Данте, Данте говорил, что мы с ним были с официальным визитом в ряде стран, так вот, когда мы встречались а, а, вот с общинами коренных народов, с правительствами, с бизнесом, и вот мы слушали ситуацию об одном и том же. Только позиция бизнеса и правительства была одна, да? а прави, позиция и информация, которую мы получали об этом же, вот общин коренных народов, она была абсолютно другая. Как я уже говорил, да, это было ощущение такое, что эти люди из правительства и бизнеса и общины коренных народов живут на разных планетах, даже не соседи, да, даже не в разных странах, а просто вообще на разных планетах, да, потому что рассказывают абсолютно о разном. Да, и мы видим ситуацию, что она на самом деле такая, да, что правительство рассказывает сказки, а страдают от того, что происходит коренные народы. И здесь, конечно, 
очень важно, чтобы вот эти вот эм, позиции разных сторон, разных э, стейкхолдеров были максимально-максимально ну, приближены. Вот э, спасибо Йоханусу, Хасе, они представили очень хороший, интересный доклад, и они как раз много говорили о том, что применение вот этих руководящих принципов, да, по которым, о которых мы сегодня говорим, по которым работаем, очень сильно отстает от написанных документов. И вот здесь как раз очень важно с тем, чтобы в следующие года, в следующее время было уделено внимание как раз именно реализации. Я хотел бы сказать, что очень много нужных и важных рекомендаций было бы сделать для следующих шагов, для следующего десятилетия. Я должен сказать, что э, так, эти рекомендации также должны быть и самими коренными народами, для коренных народов, потому что все-таки да, от коренных народов, от их настойчивости, от их работы зависит очень много. И это очень важно. Э, я бы сделал несколько рекомендаций. Э, рекомендации для э, структуры ООН. В первую очередь, чтобы все структуры ООН, которые занимаются этим вопросом, в первую очередь, конечно же, вот рабочая группа ООН по правам человека, а также структуры ООН, которые занимаются коренными народами. Постоянный форум, спецдокладчик, экспертный механизм, чтобы было понимание, что и руководящие принципы, декларации ООН о правах коренных народов и принцип ПИК должны быть сгармонизированы и должны учит, взаимоучитываться. Для правительств было бы важно рекомендовать, чтобы были выделены ресурсы для общин коренных народов, которые затронуты деятельностью бизнеса, с тем, чтобы они могли в реальности пользоваться вот этими руководящими принципами. Потому что из-за отсутствия ресурсов, из-за отсутствия многих-многих возможностей для коренных народов руководящие принципы являются очень и очень, к сожалению, далеким документом. И в этой связи я хотел бы, может быть, сделать еще одно очень конкретное предложение для рабочей группы, для э, вот, постоянного форума, экспертного механизма и спецзакладчика. Мы знаем, да, что есть, к сожалению, немного структур в системе ООН, решение которых является обязательным. Я не буду говорить про а, Совет Безопасности, я скажу, скажу про ВТО, Всемирную Торговую Организацию. Как мы все хорошо знаем, да, нарушение правил Всемирной Торговой Организации очень жестко карается. И поэтому все страны стараются это соблюдать. Я бы предложил провести с ВТО, вот этим нашим структурам, рабочей группе, постоянному форуму, может быть, вместе объединившись да, с спецзакладчиком и экспертному механизму провести переговоры с ВТО о включении их правила первое соблюдение руководящих принципов и второе это соблюдение принципов ФИК. Я думаю, что это могло бы очень сильно повлиять и на правительство, и на бизнес. Спасибо большое. Thank you very much, uh, Pavel, for sharing your thoughts on this rather difficult question uh, and for also coming up with a very concrete uh, recommendations. Um, we would also like our last panelist to reflect on this same question and therefore I'm pleased to welcome uh, Dr. Daly Sambo Duro, an indigenous Inuit from Alaska. Uh, she is the international chair of the In Inuit Circumpolar Council uh, and she has been involved directly in the debates and negotiations of the UN Declaration and the ILO Convention 169 for many, many years. Uh, she has also been a, a chairperson and an expert member of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues and is now a chair of the International Law Association Committee on Implementation of the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. So welcome uh, very much to you, Daily Sambo, the floor is yours. 
All right, thank you very much. I'll just share um, some brief comments. I recognize that the, the time is short. Um, and building upon what uh, uh, my brother Pavel has indicated, I think first of all, that it's important to uh, recognize the challenge of implementation of every instrument, right? Uh, it has been some years since the adoption of the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and many still face uh, the challenge of implementation. And so I wanna focus on just a few um, considerations and uh, possible actions that Indigenous Peoples can take in order to, to trigger implementation. Uh, before doing so, I think it's important to recognize that there are multiple intersecting instruments that uh, need to be um, taken into account in regard to potential implementation and to use uh, not only the guiding principles as a tool, but all of the other intersecting instruments. Um, Pavel has just mentioned the World Trade Organization and uh, the various different um, uh, policy and rules and, and guidelines that emerge just within that context. And so that helps to suggest uh, the, the number of intersecting instruments uh, that are useful to Indigenous peoples. If we think about them in the context of uh, the various different venues that Indigenous peoples are trying to influence right now, such as the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the Convention on Biological Diversity. You can see that there are elements within each of these uh, more environmentally focused um, instruments that lend themselves to um, uh, assisting us in terms of implementation of the guiding principles. I also want to comment that, um, that this activity should take place at, at all scales. And uh, too often uh, we assess and miss uh, the, the most important scales at the micro level. And by this, I mean the actions of, of society at the local level, the regional level, the national level, as well as the international level, or the um, national action plans, for example, uh, focused on the, the, the national uh, or domestic context when in fact the decision making that's going to potentially impact indigenous peoples the most is at the micro level at the local government level at the at the provincial or in the case of the US that at the state level so um, to keep these two items in mind as far as implementation is concerned they recognizing that there are numerous international instruments that intersect with the guiding principles and and to, uh, again, address these matters um, at all different uh, scales. I wanted to point out um, before uh, getting into other specific uh, recommendations, one of the things that has emerged uh, in relation to the Arctic region, uh, which I think is a positive development, but doesn't go far enough, um, and needs um, a greater, um, greater detail, especially in relation to indigenous peoples, that though the, UN, though the US has developed a, a national action plan, one of the things that has emerged in the context originally of the World Economic Forum is the Arctic Investment Protocol. And there are broad principles in this investment protocol. Uh, for example, there are only six of them. Uh, the objective of, of building a resilient society through economic development, uh, respecting and including indigenous peoples in, in the context of, of economic development, pursuing measures to protect the Arctic environment. Um, also, um, responsible and transparent business methods, uh, consulting and integrating uh, science as well as the use of indigenous knowledge. And uh, finally, uh, strengthening Pan-Arctic collaboration and sharing or north to north uh, sharing of information. And it may, 
It may have uh, gaps and, and uh, lack detail, but uh, I think it's significant that on the regional basis, uh, an effort has been made to try to embrace some of the important driving forces behind uh, economic development, and especially in an area, the Arctic region, which has become so significant in terms of geostrategic and geopolitical considerations. Uh, at present, we're under an extraordinary amount of pressure because everyone has their eyes on the Arctic, including uh, the obviously security and defense issues, uh, the non-Arctic state issues. So just quickly turning to some of the um, considerations to draw attention uh, to the need for implementation, I would suggest that um, indigenous peoples on a regional basis or potentially uh, globally, uh, take time to do inquiries and, uh, into uh, exactly uh, from their point of view, or I should say buy in for themselves uh, to assess and inquire about the conditions concerning uh, the guiding principles in order to give a full indigenous lens to uh, the, the impacts or the potential impacts. Uh, they could also um, uh, initiate at a domestic level national inquiries, uh, similar to, uh, for example, what um, has been practiced in the context of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, a an, an national inquiry that uh, puts uh, together a, 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 and it could be all indigenous led or it could be done in partnership with others. Um, uh, it could be uh, prompted by, uh, by government, prompted and funded by government would uh, be best, but continue to be indigenous led or possibly a process that includes uh, indigenous peoples and uh, independent review. Um, I know of for, um, for a fact, the um, independent review process of the Sardar Sardavar uh, projects in India. Of course, the World Bank is probably less inclined to assist in any way, but it is an example of how to do uh, an, an assessment or an inquiry. Um, also, of course, uh, for indigenous peoples that uh, a host of different scales or levels is uh, continuing the negotiation and dialogue specifically over the guiding principles. Um, how to weave it into uh, possible legislation, national or federal legislation, uh, and looking at the existing policies and how to uh, enhance existing policies and broaden their scope to include uh, the guiding principles or to pursue activities based uh, specifically on the guiding principles in terms of national legislation. Obviously, uh, the volume has looked at, um, at judicial me mechanisms um, litigation and judicial mechanisms at uh, the international as well as the national level uh, could be undertaken as well. Sometimes these are not the most uh, expedient ways to gain uh, results in implementation, but nevertheless, uh, we have extraordinary tools in the form of the uh, UN Declaration, the American Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and ILO Convention Number 169. When you marry this with the fact that uh, according to the International Law Association, one of the important general principles as well as um, customary international law principles uh, in favor of indigenous peoples is their right to redress reparations and, and recourse. Um, and obviously the human rights uh, treaty bodies and uh, uh, depending upon uh, the government of the day and its, uh, its orientation and ideology, um, the possibilities for policy through executive order or uh, indeed constitutional reform, which would uh, create an openness, at least a political and legal space for inclusion of important um, important elements of the guiding principles to ensure that indigenous peoples are front and center in terms of these activities. This all sounds um, 
easy to say, but uh, obviously all of these matters are, are really difficult to do. But uh, the final comment I would make is that any approaches would uh, require a multi-pronged approach and um, include many different actors, but obviously uh, substantial resources and um, tools to organize people to sustain uh, such uh, important implementation enterprises. So with those words, uh, thank you so much for the opportunity to contribute at least some uh, few perspectives. Thank you so so much, Daily Sambo, for your uh, really good uh, recommendations and suggestions, and also for bringing in some uh, uh, at least partially uh, positive developments, also from the Arctic region, to inspire us all. Um, thank you for uh, bringing out these uh, very concrete uh, suggestions to all of us to continue uh, working on. Um, I'm really sorry that we are out of time. So I hope interpreters will stay on for another 10 minutes uh, to allow our two final speakers to give their final remarks. Uh, so I'm very honored to introduce um, the United Nations Special Rapporteur on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples to give some closing remarks. Uh, Francisco Cali, uh, please, uh, the floor is yours. Eh, estimados uh, amigos del grupo de trabajo, eh, estimados uh, amigos también del de Observatorio Ciudadano, eh, estimados miembros de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas internacional, eh, eh, hermanos y hermanas del representante de los pueblos indígenas. Es un honor para mí haber aceptado la invitación para hablar en este importante evento. Saludo a los, a los autores del texto que se presenta hoy y al público que nos sigue de forma virtual. En mi calidad de relator especial he tomado nota y he estado tomando nota y he escuchado con mucha atención lo presentado por eh, los eh, que han participado en este foro. Y había hecho unas notas anteriormente, sin embargo, coincide mucho con lo que he escuchado el día de hoy. Dante hizo una presentación brillante sobre lo que son los principios sectores y los diferentes uh, eh, panelistas hicieron también presentación, no solo del el libro, las diferentes partes de los libros, pero también los representantes de los pueblos indígenas han presentado la realidad en el terreno. La continua violación de los derechos humanos por parte de las empresas y las prácticas de, de las empresas en el terreno es preocupante todavía. Creo necesario hacer un esfuerzo mayor para que todos nosotros nos unamos y estoy de acuerdo con Pavel de que hay una necesidad de hacer un análisis más integral sobre los diferentes instrumentos internacionales de los derechos humanos de protección de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas para eh, hacer un mejor trabajo. Yo soy del criterio de que los principios rectores han sido un avance bastante importante. Han traído al, al, a la comunidad internacional la realidad que viven los pueblos indígenas ha dado hoy un instrumento también para poder proteger los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Me consta, hemos trabajado conjuntamente, valga la redundancia, con el grupo de trabajo eh, de derechos humanos y empresas. Y, y el trabajo ha sido, ha resultado positivo. Eh, quisiera decir muchas cosas, pero como el tiempo nos apremia, solo quiero decir que. El libro es un libro que nos trae mucho análisis y además de que nos trae varias recomendaciones que los mismos autores nos han dado el día de hoy de forma resumida, eh, pero creo de que es importante tomar el tiempo para poder leer dicho, dichas recomendaciones. Es importante mencionar así rápidamente de que los avances que han tenido en el respeto a los derechos de los pueblos indígenas 
es necesario resaltar que ha sido a partir de los esfuerzos de los pueblos indígenas. Y eso es importante. La militarización eh, en las áreas de, de los pueblos de, de, de trabajo de las empresas es preocupante. La persecución, la penalización de los defensores de los derechos de los pueblos indígenas también. Eh, yo me voy a quedar acá, hay mucho que decir, como vuelvo a reiterar, pero creo de que hay otros foros con ustedes que se puede ir profundizando con respecto a este tema. Lo, felicito al grupo de trabajo por esos principios rectores, 10 años es un tiempo bastante grande, y por supuesto, invito a todos a no flaquear en el avance del respeto a los derechos de los pueblos indígenas. Y muchas gracias a IFKIA por la invitación. Thank you so much, uh, and I apologize. Uh, there were some uh, technical glitches with the interpretation, but um, yeah, thank you very much for those closing remarks. Uh, finally, I would like to give the word to Joanne Carling, the director of the Indigenous Peoples' Rights International and co-convener of the Indigenous Peoples' Major Group for Sustainable Development. Joanne, the floor is yours. You need to unmute. <laughs> yeah, sorry, thanks. <laughs> yeah, let, let me uh, first acknowledge the, the, the initiative of IFGIA in undertaking the report, which is uh, really important in drawing attention uh, in, in relation to the implementation of the UN guiding principles uh, to indigenous peoples. I, because of the lack of time, I would just like to emphasize some key uh, key recommendations uh, from this. One is the, the need to uh, strengthen the implementation of the human rights due diligence, uh, particularly in relation to the respect of indigenous people's rights, the collective rights of indigenous peoples, particularly the three interlocking rights, the right to land, territories, and resources, the right to cultural heritage and the right to self-determination. This has to be uh, fully uh, recognized uh, by states as the framework for the due diligence in the conduct of free, prior and informed consent. Because uh, there is now a, a trend that FPIC is a procedural matter, not a substantive expression of our collective rights to lands, territories, and resources. And that's, for example, what's happening in Latin America in relation to the right to consultation is actually an attempt to undermine and just reduce our right to right to consultation, not, not because we have, you know, that it's un, un, underpinned by our rights to our lands, territories, and resources, which is the one that is at the core of business interest. And we need to, to hammer that point because it may end up that the human rights due diligence that includes FPIC is merely a procedural matter uh, and that uh, um, the, the consent is not really based on, when, on the protection of our rights to our lands, territories, and resources. So that's one. The second one is the urgent need to establish redress mechanisms at the project level and at the national level. And for this to be effective, there should be resources allocated to indigenous peoples to be able to access, make use of this, um, of this um, redress mechanisms. For example, communities cannot even speak the language. So how can they make use of the national court system when they cannot even speak the language? So there is a need to provide uh, support and resources uh, for this. And, uh, and then the, 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 the third one is the adoption of, of course, a binding treaty. And of course, the EU, no? the, the EU uh, regulation for, for corporations because the, uh, a binding treaty will, will set the, uh, the, the, the certainty on the accountability of companies and states when they violate rights. So now uh, with, with those, I, I think internally what, 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 what have been mentioned is one, we need to do more outreach to indigenous communities because they're not aware 
One, they're not even aware of their rights. Second is on the UNGP. In, in all my visits to, uh, because I've been working on business and human rights for so long, and the common, the common thing that states and companies say to communities is when they take over in communities' lands and resources, they would say, you better accept our compensation offer because you don't have legal title to your lands. You're better off to receive because you, we will go in, we, we will evict you anyway. And that should change, that should change. And, and that is still the, the, the prevailing notion, no? So what we need to, and, and communities, because they're not aware of their rights, they will just give in, right? So, so in, in, in that sense, we need to do more outreach, especially to communities that are targeted by business in terms of their resources. Uh, and do, do capacity building as, as well, especially like uh, mentioned already, the, the FPIC, that communities develop their own protocol. That is the way we assert our rights to our lands, territories, and resources, our right to self-determination. That's the way we should carry it forward. So part of the capacity building is really the, the, the development of community protocols of which that will be the tool for communities to advance their rights. And I fully support the suggestion uh, of, of daily in terms of the use of different intersecting human rights instruments and tools. And this is exactly what, what we need to push. We, we need to be submitting all cases to the Committee on Economic and Social Cultural Rights, for example, highlighting all the violations when we prepare for the UPR, the abuse of women and using SEDAW, the abuse of children, all of this, we, we need to, so that the whole UN system is flooded by the need to address this issue and that impunity exists. So that, so that, that is one. And, 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 and second is the, uh, of, uh, uh, of course, the, the collaboration with others, especially with our allies, in making use of this of these mechanisms right because it also requires resources when we use these mechanisms so we need to be able to generate both financial and other forms of of, of expertise and resources needed so that we can use these existing instruments and and finally just to say this uh, to dante that that we 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 need to collaborate with the working group especially in developing the, the roadmap. So uh, just to flag Dante, we will get back to you to schedule series of consultations on, on the roadmap uh, for, that we also want to develop because it would be good for us as indigenous peoples to also have our own roadmap on how do we demand accountability uh, to, to those that has to be account? How do we assert, how do we make use of all the, the mechanisms that uh, are available? How do we do outreach? How do we do uh, building alliances and networks with, with others? And of course, we need to collaborate as well with our uh, special rapporteur, Francisco Cali. He's playing an important role in raising the continuing violation of indigenous peoples by business operations. And, and perhaps the, we can come up with like studies, continue to do studies or, or thematic reports. And also the, the suggestion a while ago of, the, of, of Dali in, in terms of doing inquiries. It can be national, but it, it can also be industry-wide, like inquiry in relation to extractive industries. Inquiry in relation to renewable energy that are violating indigenous people's rights or inquiry on the abuse of women by business. So there are different layers where we can really um, target you know, different actors so that we raise more attention to, the, to how, how the, the, the UNGP should be implemented in the context of indigenous people. So sorry for taking time, but thank you. Uh, thank you for IFGIA. Uh, that's on behalf of, of IPRI, and, and thank you also to Dante, to Francisco, uh, and all the other speakers. As um, uh, Yes, thank you. Thank you so much, Joanne, and I'm really sorry to have to cut you short, but I need to let the interpreters go. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for, for all the panelists and speakers, and 
organizers and participants, I think we had some very rich uh, elaborations to the report and I really encourage everyone to uh, download the report and to read it and uh, yeah, so thank you so much. I don't know, Dante, do you want the last word? I see your hand is raised. Thank you, sorry. Uh, just, just to say that I encourage you to participate in the process that we have opened now for the roadmap uh, finalization, because you have already contributed to the roadmap, but it's not fully done. And uh, so, and now you have an opportunity to make sure that your points of view are sufficiently well captured. Um, that's one thing. The other thing is that we are discussing with the European Union uh, they want to push for a global playing field on business and human rights, not only a European level playing field on business and human rights, which is already a political agreement uh, within the EU, but actually a global one. Third point is that we are having discussions with Japan and the United States regarding uh, business and human rights as well to make them part of a coalition that goes beyond the European Union which uh, and we are doing active fundraising with the aim to uh, create a global fund, a global trust fund for capacity building um, with the contribution of a coalition of donors. And that's why we are engaging in, with Japan, for example, because we absolutely get it that their capacity is not just invited to a workshop, but actually provide the means and the means for all players to be managed and used by themselves, not by a, a third party consultant, despite the good intentions. Um, so, and that is something that it's on, on its way, crossing fingers. Um, and we have had in this week, three meetings with the high commissioner herself, uh, in order to uh, make sure that we are on the same page that when we look into the next decade of implementation with much higher ambition, that requires a much bigger uh, investment of resources, not only of good intentions. And so I, I can't guarantee that this is going to work, but at least we are pushing in the right direction and, and pushing the right bottoms. And so far we are in good track. So thanks again for the invitation. Don't, uh, let's say, miss the opportunity to contribute. Invite us to your consultations and dialogues. Happy to participate in any format. If we need to co-convene something, very happy to put our, our branding there uh, because we need your perspective and we need your points of view and suggestions. And hopefully we'll be able to capture uh, your expectations, uh, hopefully fully, but at least to a large extent. Um, so that's what I wanted to, to share with you, more or less a good news in terms of perspective. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for uh, stretching out your hand. We will definitely uh, grab it <laughs> and continue collaboration. So thank you uh, once again, everyone, and have a good day or good evening or good night to everyone. Uh, thank you for your participation. Yeah. Bye. 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 Great to see all of you. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. See you daily. Yeah. Hasta luego. Ciao.